about to hear is true. Only the names have been changed to protect the innocent. Fatima, best of all king-size cigarettes, brings you Dragnet. You're a detective sergeant. You're assigned a robbery detail. A gang of hijackers has set up operations in your city. Truckloads of merchandise worth thousands of dollars vanish completely. The criminals know their business. Their system appears foolproof. Your job, stop them. Fatima, best of all king-size cigarettes. Definitely the best quality in its class. But the same price as the cigarette you're now smoking. Now, because of its quality, more smokers coast to coast insist Fatima. You see, Fatima contains the finest domestic and Turkish tobaccos superbly blended. And Fatima is extra mild, with a much different, much better flavor and aroma. So compare Fatima yourself. Today, you'll find Fatima gives you all the advantages of extra length, plus Fatima quality, which no other king-size cigarette has. Remember, the cost of Fatima is the same as the cigarette you're now smoking. Remember, in Fatima, the difference is quality. Next time, buy Fatima. Dragnet, the documented drama of an actual crime. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department, you will travel step by step on the side of the law through an actual case transcribed from official police files. From beginning to end, from crime to punishment, Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Saturday, November 8th. It was foggy in Los Angeles. We were working the day watch out a robbery detail. My partner's Ben Romero. The boss is Captain Didion. My name's Friday. I was on the way back from R&I, and &I, it was 11.23 a.m. when I got to room 27A. Robbery detail. Joe? Hi. Where you been, anyhow? I've been sitting here 20 minutes waiting for you. Oh, I'm sorry. I've been checking a couple names through R&I. It took a little longer than I figured. The least yes. you could do is leave a note in the book. I do the same for you. I've been sitting here 20 minutes. Oh, I told you I'm sorry. What's the matter? Are you feeling well? No, I'm all right. It's just like a little cooperation, Joe. That's all. Well, what's the matter with you? Oh, I don't know. I guess I was mad when I woke up. Got a crazy house. Well, what's the trouble? Did you have an argument with your wife? In-laws are visiting again. Six of them. Oh, where are they sleeping? All over the place. Four adults, two kids, and a gray fox terrier. He's not even housebroken. Well, how long are you going to stay? A couple of days? Two weeks. I don't know how I can last it out, Joe. They're crawling all over the place. Kids screaming, dog tearing up the front room, no privacy. I don't know what I'm going to do. Well, why don't you just level with them? Ask them if they wouldn't mind staying at a motel for a couple of days. Huh? I suggested that to the wife this morning. What's she think? That's when the argument started. Oh. Hey, um... I almost forgot to tell you that truck driver finally showed up at uh, Frank Burns. Oh, yeah, it's about time. Where is he? Took him across the hall to the mug room. Got him checking out some coming out mug books. Guess we better see how he's doing. All right. He sure took his time getting here, didn't he? Yeah, didn't offer any excuses. He's no more help than he was yesterday. Yeah. Surly. Not very cooperative. How you doing, Mr. Burns? You remember my partner, Sergeant Friday. How are you, Burns? I got a headache. This is just a waste of time wading through all these pictures. I've been through two of these books already. I couldn't identify any of the guys. Yeah, well, we know it's pretty tedious. We'd just like to have you check through a few more volumes, if you wouldn't mind. Look, I don't mind giving you a hand when I got time, but I got things to do today. I got something on for tonight. Have to get a haircut, my suit pressed. Well, this thing's pretty important to us, Burroughs. I know we're putting you out, but we need every lead we can get. We'd certainly appreciate it if you could just give us a little more cooperation. I don't know what else I can do. I told you everything I know, just the way it happened. A few more things we'd like to ask you about, sir. Some of the details you didn't make quite clear. Well, what details? How do you mean? Details about the hijacking. Mind going over it again, boss? I laid it out for you the last time you talked to me, just the way it went. It's the same as the rest. Well, how do you mean, the same as the rest? Well, the other hijackings are the same as those. No different. You pretty familiar with the other jobs, are you? Well, followed them in the paper. Read the bullet and the cops got out on them. It's up on the dispatch board in the garage. Okay. It... Is that fresh water in that cooler over there? Yeah, I think so. Help us out. Thanks. Gotta have a couple of aspirin for this headache. Can't take the aspirin without water. Yeah. You've been driving a couple of years for Lavelle Trucking Lines. Is that right, Burroughs? Yeah, that's right, yeah. What if you'd mind running it through for us again, Burroughs? Maybe there's a few details about the thing that you forgot to mention, huh? It won't be any different than last time. 
I pulled out from the loading dock about 6 o'clock yesterday morning, hauling a load of Scotch whiskey over to Phoenix. Mm -hmm. Pulled up for the red light at Alameda and Jackson. That's when the guy pulled open the door and got in next to me. Put a gun in my ribs, told me to look straight ahead. The first thing he did was hand me a pair of goggles and tell me to put them on. Same kind the welders use. The front of the lens was covered with tape. I put them on. I couldn't see a thing. The guy took over the wheel and started driving. Well, did you have any idea what direction you were heading in? Oh, not with the goggles on. I tried to follow at first, but I got all mixed up. Couldn't tell where he was driving. Made quite a few turns. He drove about 20, 25 minutes, I guess, before we pulled up. Mm -hmm. That's where the switching point was. Two more guys met us there. I could only tell by the voices they pulled me out of the truck and put me in a car. Well, can you tell us anything at all about that transfer point? I mean, were there any sounds, anything like that, that give you an idea that maybe where you were? Well, I figure it must have been someplace out in the valley, pretty far out. No traffic sounds at all, just crickets, you know, things like that. Mm -hmm. He got me in that car, drove around about an hour, I figure. And they put me on out at the side of the road, told me to leave the goggles on for ten minutes, and then they drove off. Well, how about those two men at the transfer point? If you heard their voices again, you think you could recognize them? I don't know. I doubt it. They didn't say too much. Not that I heard, anyway. I'm just curious, Burris. How is it you thought of calling your company first instead of the police? Well, it's their cargo, a whole load of whiskey. If somebody hijacked it, I figure the company ought to be the first to know. I'd like to ask you just one more question. There's no offense intended here. Yeah? You ever been arrested? Well, why? What'd that have to do with it? Well, probably nothing at all. Have you ever been arrested? I'd like to set you straight on it right now. If you think I was working inside on this thing, you got it wrong. I didn't have anything to do with it. Then there's nothing to worry about, is there? All right. Yeah, I've been arrested. When was that, Burroughs? About ten years ago. It was back east, West Virginia. What was the charge? Hijacking. Our records showed no previous arrests for Frank Burroughs. For the next few days, he was kept under observation. When we got the kickback from Washington, it showed Burroughs had one previous arrest, the one he told us about, for hijacking. We checked all his friends, relatives, and associates. We found nothing suspicious. His employer said that they were aware of his police record, but they told us that Burroughs was one of the best drivers they had. There was nothing to link him with a series of hijackings which had been going on all over the city for the past month. Our crime lab checked the pair of goggles which Burroughs had been forced to wear during the hijacking. They were an ordinary industrial type, easily obtained and impossible to trace. Other than those belonging to Burroughs, there were no fingerprints on them. Late that afternoon, the missing truck and trailer was found empty in a deserted section of the valley. No latent fingerprints or other physical evidence. 9 a.m. the next morning, we met with Captain Didion. Cargo's gone, huh? Not a trace of it. That's it, Skipper. High-grade Scotch whiskey, 150 cases. Got out of bolts and all the liquor wholesalers. The serial number's listening. That ex-con Burroughs, nothing turned up on him? No, nothing. We double-checked everything about him. He's clean. You didn't get a thing off that abandoned truck? No prints, no physical evidence. Seems like they got it down to a science. Tell that to Thad Brown. He's getting all the kicks from the warehouse operators. 30 days and six hijackings. How about moving faster? Well, as you know, we got 12 stakeouts running down freight loads, Skipper. Yeah. Incoming, outgoing. Got three girls in the stats office doing nothing but making runs for us. No new suspect. We got a meeting with an informant after lunch. He figures he may have something. There's nothing to bank on. Now. How about an inside tip-off on these jobs? Any indication the gang's working something like that? No, nothing definite, Skipper. Jobs seem to be pretty well cased, though. We've checked out everybody with a record working for the trucking lines. No reason to think any of them had a hand in it. Excuse me a minute. Yeah. Did in. Yeah. Live Oak near Trenton Avenue. Yeah, I got it right. Thank you. We got another truck early this morning. Where? There's a location. Better move on it. Looks like they got their signals crossed. How do you mean? Doesn't make sense. Cargo they hijacked. What was it? A load of toothbrushes. 9.23 a.m. Ben and I drove to the intersection of Live Oak Drive and Trenton Avenue in the Hollywood Hills where we located the latest driver to fall victim to the gang of hijackers. His story was the same as the others. He'd stopped his truck for a red light at a deserted intersection when a man jumped on the running board and pointed a gun at his head. The man with the gun took over the wheel and forced the driver to put on a pair of blacked-out welder's goggles. Then the truck was moved to a remote spot where the driver was transferred to a car and later released in a remote section of the Hollywood Hills. The hijacked truck was found empty a day later. And again, there was no physical evidence, no fingerprints. The driver could add little to what we already knew. The only point that made the case any different from those that had gone before was the cargo that had been stolen, a load of toothbrushes. We began an immediate check of the neighborhood where, according to the driver, he was first held up. It was a fairly remote intersection in the San Fernando Valley. After four hours of interviewing ranchers and gas station attendants, we talked to the operator of a practice driving range for golfers located just off the highway. 
His name was Fred Garrison. Matter of fact, I did notice something out of the ordinary this morning. A little before 6 a.m., I think. Spotted this big semi turning off on that dirt road down the highway there. Now, uh, which dirt road is that, Mr. Garrison? Oh, right up the highway there. See it? Oh, yeah. It turns off by that clump of trees. Mm-hmm. Couldn't figure out why a big truck and trailer be taking that road. Doesn't make sense. How do you mean, sir? Well, it's a dead end. No reason why a driver would turn off there by mistake. There's a big sign right there at the intersection. It says, not a through street. Right there. See it? Plain mm-hmm. as day. I wonder if you could describe the truck for us, Mr. Garrison. Well, it's pretty good size. One of those big aluminum jobs. Black lettering on the side, I think. Yeah, it turned off the highway, went down the dirt road a little ways, and then it turned off into that grove of trees, and the driver cut the lights. Mm-hmm. Did you notice any activity going on at all? No, no, I didn't. Oh, maybe I should have walked over and checked it. I figured it was just some truck driver pulling up to catch a few winks of sleep. I see. My boy Dave was with me at the time. Wanted to check it, but I told him to mind his own business. He says a couple of minutes after the truck pulled in, he saw a gray sedan come down the road and park next to the truck right in that same clump of trees. Well, now, didn't all this look a little suspicious to you, sir? Oh, I suppose so, in a way. I just don't like the metal where it's not my business, that's all. Well, did your boy Dave get a good look at this gray sedan? Do you know that? Uh, you want to come in the office sit down? Sure. Oh, thanks. Sit right there if you like. Fine, thank, thank you. you. Uh, let's see now, where were we? About your boy Dave. Sir. Oh, yeah, yeah. You said that he saw a gray sedan pull in next to the truck over in that clump of trees. Did he mention anything else that he noticed about the car? I mean, other than the fact that it was a gray sedan. Oh, well, yeah, I think he did say something else about it. Now, let's see. Uh, I wasn't listening too close at the time. Uh, Dave's doing some errands downtown for me right now. He'll be phoning in pretty soon, though. I can ask him about it then. He paid a lot more attention to the thing than I did. Well, how long were the truck and trailer and that sedan parked in the grove of trees? Do you remember that? Yeah, well, not too long. Maybe 15, 20 minutes. Mm-hmm. Uh, the car pulled out first and took off down the highway away from town. That way, see? Mm-hmm. And the truck and trailer left a few minutes after. What do you figure they were up to? We've got an idea. What time was that again, sir, when you saw the truck turn off the highway onto the dirt road? About 6 a.m. Maybe a few minutes one way or the other. Uh-huh. I wonder if you'd show us the exact spot where you saw that truck park, would you? Oh, sure. Here. You want to come over here with me to the window? All right. Uh, now, you see the clump of trees there? Yeah. A eucalyptus. Mm-hmm. Uh, they border right on the road? Yeah. Uh, maybe that's him now. All right. Garrison Fairways. Oh, yeah, Dave. How'd you make out? Mm-hmm. Oh, fine. No, no, no. Well, listen, a couple of policemen here now, they're asking about that truck and that gray sedan you saw up on the road this morning. Want to know what you noticed about the sedan besides the color? How's that? Oh, you did, uh-huh. Yeah. Well, you better head back here. They probably want to talk to you about it. All right, Davey. Bye. What do you have to say? Oh, he'll be back in about 20 minutes. I figured you want to talk to him. Well, how about the sedan, sir? Did he get a pretty good look at it, did he say? Yeah, I guess so. He got part of license number. Fred Garrison's son, Dave, returned and gave us all the pertinent facts about the truck and the gray sedan, which he'd noticed in the neighborhood early that morning. His description of the truck and trailer, what he saw of it anyway, matched closely with that of the latest vehicle to be hijacked. He described the car as a gray sedan, and he said it looked to him like it was a late model Nash, but he couldn't be sure. He said the first three units on the license plate were 7T7. The location in the grove of trees where the truck had been spotted was checked thoroughly. Outside of some indefinite tire tracks, there was no physical evidence. 4.10 p.m., we put in a call to DMV and asked for a rundown on the three license plate numbers. The next morning, DMV returned to us a list of more than a 1,000 auto registrations, which began with the figure 7T7. We went down the list and gradually eliminated 600 of these as not being physically close in description to the car seen by Garrison's boy, Dave. We kept checking. Almost 300 more on the list were registered in distant parts of the state. That left us with over 100 vehicles registered in or around Los Angeles to check out. It went slow. Three weeks passed. We narrowed the list down to 23 possibles. Tuesday, December 10th. We were checking registrations with addresses in the east end of the city. What's the name on this one again? Perry. Uh, Walter R. Perry. Mm-hmm. Garage is straight back to drive. There's a car park in it. Yeah. Let's try the bell again, huh? What do you say? All right, let's give the car a look. People sure do get careless. Nobody home, garage wide open, car sitting there. Mm-hmm. Qualifies so far. You want to check the steering post there, registration thing? I get it, yeah. Check out, all right? Just a minute. 
What do you got there? Here. Found these under the seat. Oh. Maybe we're home. Yeah, it's a pair of goggles. Take a look. Yeah. Both lenses covered with tape. You're in the forgery division of the Metropolitan Police Department. Handwriting analysis. Now, let's check it against the forged letter. The capitals print evenly. The O's and the A's are clean. No, this isn't the typewriter we're looking for. Yeah. Uh, capitals print high. A's and O's are solid. P slanted. This is the one. It's the same with cigarettes. There are many king-size brands to choose from, but when you know all the facts, you'll make your choice Fatima. Here are those facts. Fatimas are the same in length and circumference. 85 millimeters long, one and one sixty-fourths inches around. And Fatima filters the smoke exactly the same long distance as any other king-size cigarette. But in Fatima, the difference is quality. Remember, Fatima gives you extra mildness. A much different, much better flavor and aroma. You get all the advantages of extra length, plus Fatima quality, which no other king-size cigarette has. Fatima, best of all king-size cigarettes. Definitely the best quality in its class, but the same price as the cigarette you are now smoking. Next time, buy Fatima. <laughs> December 10th, 2.15 p.m. The pair of goggles found in the automobile registered to Walter R. Perry were the same brand and style as the goggles used to black out the truck drivers and all the previous hijackings. Ben and I searched the car, but we failed to come up with any additional physical evidence. We left the garage, checked the house again to make sure that there was nobody at home. Then we went down the street, close to the house, to where we parked our car. We put in a call to R and I and requested a make on Walter R. Perry. He had no previous criminal record. A few minutes later, we spotted two women loaded with grocery bags come down the street, go up the stairs of the Perry house, and let themselves in with a key. We went up to the front door, rang the bell, and the younger of the two women answered. Dark brown hair, blue eyes, about five foot six, 28, 29 years old. We identified ourselves, and she showed us into the living room. She told us her name was Leona Perry, and that Walter Perry was her husband. They'd been married 11 years, no children. We asked her where her husband was, and she said he was out of town on a business trip up north to Monta Vista, California. We asked her what line of business he was in. Well, right now, Walter's a jewelry salesman. He works for himself. Has to do quite a bit of traveling. Your husband's blonde, about five nine hundred and sixty pounds. Is that right? Yes, that's right. How do you go up north, ma'am? Do you know? Well, I think he went up by train. I'm not sure. You have any idea how we might contact your husband up north? No, I'm afraid I don't. He said he had a couple of business appointments in different towns in that area up there. He didn't tell me where he'd be staying. What's it about, Sergeant? Just a routine check, Miss Perry. Is that a photograph of your husband over there on the piano? Yes. Mm -hmm. When's he expected back, you know? Oh, let's see. This is Tuesday. He should be home sometime Thursday. I see. A minute ago, you said right now your husband's a jewelry salesman. Is that his usual line of work? No, Walt is a truck driver. He work here in Los Angeles? No, he drove for a company up north in the Bay Area, Oakland, Berkeley. He had that job for ten years, almost from the day we were married. Mm -hmm. And then last December, he had a fight with a boss, and he quit. We moved down here to find work, but he just couldn't seem to get placed. How long has he been selling jewelry, ma'am? Oh, about eight months, I'd say. He's doing very good at it. We have more now than when he was driving a truck. A lot of money in the jewelry business. Well, it's just you and your husband living here, is that right? No, my mother lives with us, too. We just got back from doing the shopping. I guess she's busy putting the groceries I away. See. Mom? Uh, oh, say that's all right, ma'am. I think you can give us the information we need. Well, I'd like to know what this is about. I'd appreciate it if you'd tell me. Walter isn't in any kind of trouble, is he? Just a routine investigation, Miss Perry. Doesn't necessarily mean your husband's involved. I can tell you right now, my husband isn't involved in anything. Walter's never had trouble with the police in his life. Walter has trouble with the police? What is it, Leon? It's nothing, Ma. These policemen want to talk to Walter. They just want to ask him a few questions, that's all. Uh, this is my mother, Mrs. Burt. Ma, this you. is... Mr. Friday, Mr. Romero. Right. I told you, Leon, I felt it all day. Something's wrong. Walter's done something, hasn't he? Now, don't start on that again, Ma, please. The officers told me they want to talk to Walter. That's all. What 
for? If he hasn't done anything, why do they want to talk to him? Routine duty, ma'am. There's nothing to get excited about. I knew it would happen. I felt it all the time. That funny job he has selling jewelry, going out at all hours. Couldn't fool me. I knew it wasn't right. What's he done? Where his relatives? We got a right to know. Well, there's nothing we can tell you definitely, ma'am. How about these odd working hours your husband has, Miss Perry? What's the reason for that? Could you tell us? Well, I don't know. Walter works for himself. He just has to make business contacts when he can. That's all. Sometimes it's late at night, sometimes early in the morning. Why don't you stay out of it, Ma? After all, it's our business. Walt is in mine. You just mark my word, Leona. Find out about this. That husband of yours has done something, and these policemen are after him. I knew it wasn't right. I felt it all along. No, please take me. Oh. jewelry business is big money. I should have left and taken you with me the day it started. Walter's a truck driver. It's all you'll ever be. It's where he should have stayed. Why are you always picking on Walter? Why? Because I told you in the first place you never should have married him. Eleven years ago, I told you. I never should have come to stay with you. You couldn't go and marry one of those nice boys you met at school. It had to be Walter Perry. Well, maybe you'll see now. Trouble with the police. Now you'll see what kind of a man you Shut married. up, Ma. Sorry. Well, I'm afraid that isn't helping much, Miss Burke. I suppose not. What is it that can help? You have kids, you try to tell them something, make it easy for them, they never listen. Now, that gray sedan back in the garage, ma'am, does anyone else drive it besides Mr. Perry, do you know? No, Leona doesn't drive. Walter's the only one who runs it. He drives it to all these business appointments he has at odd hours? That's right. How many times he doesn't take it it's when he's out of town. Uh, you ever seen this pair of goggles before, ma'am? No, I never have. What does it mean, that tape all over the front of them? Well, how about your son-in-law's friends? Do you ever bring any of them here to the house? Not since I've been staying here the last six months. A lot of men call him on the phone and he goes out. Doesn't bring anyone around, though. Oh, I'm just sick. I'm well, sick. can you tell us anything about this jewelry business Mr. Perry's working in? I don't even want to think about it. I raised four daughters, nice girls, every one of them attractive. You make plans for them and you want them to be happy and marry some nice fellow, have a nice, comfortable home. You try to tell them and they never listen. About the car, ma'am. They get to be 17 and they know everything. My girls could have married wealthy if they were smart. A lot of other girls have done it. They had nice clothes. They got through business school, good home training, all this talk about love. They're all so smart. They know everything, and they know nothing. This is what happens. They wake up and find out. Would you finish putting the girls through the way, Ma? I'll talk to the officers. Anything you want, Leona. I didn't mean to upset you. Maybe things will be all right. And just a few more questions, Miss Perry, that's all. Well, whatever it is, I know Walter hasn't done anything wrong. He wouldn't do anything wrong. It doesn't make sense. There's just no reason for it. I remember your father, Leona. Sixteen years we were married. One night he packed up and left me. There wasn't any reason for that either. Wasn't there, Mom? We continued questioning the wife and the mother-in-law of the suspect, Walter Perry. From the wife, we got the names and addresses of four close friends of Perry's who were supposed to be associates of his in the jewelry business. In the basement and in a loft over the garage, we found more than a dozen cases of high-grade Scotch whiskey cases of expensive furs and other loot taken in the hijackings. Mrs. Perry said her husband told her he was storing the stuff for some friends. It was only a small portion of the take. We called the office and got out a broadcast and an APB on the suspect and arranged for an immediate stakeout on the Perry house. And then, together with Matthews and Gonzalez from robbery detail, we began checking out the four close friends of the suspect. We could locate only two of them, but those two paid off. In the basements and garages of their homes, we found another portion of the loot, along with evidence that showed that both men had taken active parts in the hijackings. They were booked at the main jail on suspicion of 211 PC. A full week went by. The stakeout continued on the Perry house. Still no sign of him. Saturday, December 20th, 4.45 p.m. We checked back in at the office. This thing's sure dragging out, huh? Yeah, it'd be nice to wrap it up before Christmas, wouldn't it? Get it out of the way. Might work into a couple of days off. Yeah, I don't know if I'm too interested, Joe. What? The days off. I mean, we got visitors on the way again. What do you mean for the holidays? Who's coming? Same old bunch. My brother-in-law and his wife and his kids and that little dog of theirs. Well, they were just with you for three weeks, weren't they? What's the deal? Oh, my brother-in-law got home, found a notice from his company. He's been transferred out here. Oh. They're going to stay with us all through the holidays, and then they'll start house hunting. How about that? Mm, you've got a problem. It's got a new rug in the living room. How about 20 to 1 on it, Joe? What's that? A little fox terrier. Oh, hi, Skipper. Anything before we check out? Piece of news for you. Just talked to the Ventura Sheriff's Office. We owe him a favor. What do you mean? They grabbed Walter Perry half an hour ago. Monday, December 22nd. Suspect Walter Perry was returned to Los Angeles. He was taken to the interrogation room where Captain Didion, Ben, and I questioned him for almost two hours. He was confronted with the evidence and testimony against him, and after another hour and a half of interrogation, he broke. He gave us a full signed statement describing his part in the campaign of hijackings. He also gave us the names of everyone in the gang, how they participated, and to what extent. 
He said most of the property looted from the hijacked trucks was stored in a rented barn located at the north end of the San Fernando Valley. A detail of men checked it and confirmed the information. The suspect's wife, Leona, was notified of her husband's arrest. 1.35 p.m., we completed our interrogation. That's it, Perry. Let's go. You ask me a lot of questions. How about it? Can I ask you one? What's that? Well, why do you think I did it? Why I got mixed up in this? Well, according to your statement, you wanted the money, admit it. Well, you've been out to my house, haven't you? You met my wife? Yeah, that's right. I guess you met her mother, too. Yeah. Well, then you got it. Nobody in the world could make me go for a hijack deal, but she could. I even remember the morning I'd made up my mind to do it. I was out in the kitchen. I hear yapping at Leona in the other room, same old roasting. Mm -hmm. A lousy truck driver, that was me. Eleven years, the wife and I have been married. Her mother lived with us, nine of them. Didn't get any better, didn't get any worse. Just the same old yapping, her and her four girls. Why couldn't they listen to her? They were the best girls in the world. Why couldn't they marry money? Why did it have to be guys like truck drivers, stupid truck drivers? Same thing every day, always the same. Nine years of it. I... So I went out to get enough money to rub in her face, enough to make her choke on you. You can hate somebody for that. I don't know how many years they'll give me, but I'm going to hate her every one. Matt? Oh, hi, Olsen. You want to remain jail this morning to go? Only be a minute, Rex. Right. Thank you. All right, Craig. Yeah. Uh, Sergeant, my wife's been told, huh? She, she knows about it? She's waiting outside in the hall with her mother. You can see him on the way out. Oh, thanks. Did you do it? Ask your mother there, honey. You heard as much of it as I did. Nine years' worth. I, I guess it finally got me sick. She wanted you to have money, so I went out to get it. You, you come and see me when you can? Leon, I wasn't going to any jail to see you. I knew it all along. I knew what you were. It's the truth. She never should have married you. All right, Perry. Let's go, mister. Hold. Hold. Why, man? How are you figuring? I don't know. How about some coffee? Huh? Okay. Sure is funny. You see other people sweating it out, your troubles look like nothing. I'm just thinking about it. What's that? Those in-laws of mine. What about them? Guess I haven't got it half bad. The story you have just heard was true. Only the names were changed to protect the innocent. On March 5th, trial was held in Superior Court, Department 87, City and County of Los Angeles, State of California. In a moment, the results of that trial. And now, here is our star, Jack Webb. Thank you. Friends, from our many talks with law enforcement agencies and letters from police officers, we're especially gratified to know that a great number of these men agree with us, that Fatima is the best of all long cigarettes. Now, our latest sales figures back that up. Every week, more and more smokers are enjoying king-size Fatimas. People from every state, from all walks of life. If you haven't tried Fatimas yet, buy a pack tomorrow. In Fatima, the difference is quality. The quality is better. But the cost of Fatima is the same as the cigarettes you're now smoking. Next time, buy king-size Fatima. <laughs> Walter Richard Perry was tried and convicted on several counts of robbery in the first degree. He was sentenced to the state penitentiary for the term prescribed by law. First degree robbery is punishable by a term of five years to life. His accomplices receive similar sentences. Ladies and gentlemen, as we know, thousands of people in Kansas, Missouri, Oklahoma, and Illinois have been driven from their homes by floodwaters. Many are being sheltered and fed by the Red Cross. All Americans are urged to give through their local Red Cross chapters. Your contribution of just a dollar will give you a feeling of justifiable pride. You have just heard Dragnet, a series of authentic cases from official files. Technical advice comes from the office of Chief of Police, W.H. Parker, Los Angeles Police Department. Fatima. Best of all, king-size cigarettes has brought you Dragnet, transcribed from Los Angeles. Stay tuned for Counter Spy, next on NBC.